Beautiful. In honor of Mother's Day, man, I want to start out with a little funny that I stole from my Marine Corps buddy over there. And I want to thank all of you guys, ladies, for being here today, my friends from FedEx, my family back there, and just all of y'all, man. Just, just really appreciate y'all being here today. It's, if you've ever been um, to pre-marriage counseling before you got married, or if you've ever been to marriage counseling, um, usually they talk about the five love languages, right? Somebody, if y'all say, if, if you know what I'm talking about, say amen. amen. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. So we got the words of affirmation, right? So here are what I call the five love languages of Texas. Words of affirmation, your tacos are delicious. <laughs> come on, y'all. Come on. That's got to be funny, man. Acts of service, I made you tacos. <laughs> Receiving gifts, here's a taco. Quality time, let's go out for tacos together. And the physical touch, let me hold you like a taco. Come on, man. Well, y'all rough this morning, man. I'm already in, I'm already in the fire, man. Hey, um, man, um, in honor of Mother's Day, man, I really wanted to bring this story here about a, a woman who finds herself in a desperate situation and who steps out in, in, in faith. But I want people to know, as you heard it in the reading, yes, Jesus healed her from her infirmities and, and provided her a miracle. But the miracle was not just that physical healing. Jesus is always interested more in your spiritual well-being than your physical well-being. Amen? And if you leave here today, I, I really want you to leave here knowing that Jesus died on the cross for you. And out of anything he wants most from you is a personal relationship. Romans 3.23 says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. And because we missed the mark, Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. But one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 5.8. It says, but God, man, demonstrated his love while we were sinning, Christ died for us. So that gives us hope, right? Ephesians 2 verses 8 says that for by grace you have been saved and not of works lest any man should boast. So what's the key? How do I get this Jesus in my life? Romans 10 and 9 says if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus died and God raised him from the dead, you shall be Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for our moms. Lord, we thank you for the godly women in our lives, Lord, who you have given us, Father. We thank you. We praise you for them, and we praise them, Father, for all of the things that they do in our lives, Lord. We love you. Father, I ask that you would remove me from this, Lord, and allow your Holy Spirit to take over, Lord. Use me to preach your word accurately, Lord, correctly, Father God, with boldness and confidence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can you go to the slide, please? The next one. Now, when you go throughout the history of, of womanhood, period, women have always, throughout history, including in the Bible, have been rejected, have been hurt, have been abused, have been lied on, and just all of that, right? And we, 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 we start even in the garden with Adam and Eve. When God made Eve, right? And Adam woke up from his sleep and he saw Eve. He said, good googly goo. <laughs> Baby, I love you. Thank you, God. You gave me the best thing that I could ever have. And then when they sinned and God came into the garden and God went to Adam and God said to Adam, what have you done? What did Adam do? He pointed to that woman and he said, it was her, God. It was her. She did it, God. The woman that you, God, gave me. So right off the bat, in the beginning, men have always, men started out accusing women falsely. God, it was her fault. God, it was her fault. We got Sarah. Oh, man, we love Sister Sarah, right? The wife of Abraham. When you go to Hebrews, man, Abraham and, and um, Sarah are all through the, um, the first couple of verses in there in Hebrews, right? But did you know that twice Abraham was afraid for his life? And you know what he told his wife? Pretend that you are my sister. 
because by law, technically, you really are my sister. And so I don't want them to kill me. And so you just go in front of Pharaoh and them and tell them that you're my sister. Any husbands ever do that? Hey, babe, look, you know what, you know what? Look, just for right now, just come on, come on, come on, man. We be throwing our wives up under there, man. We be throwing our wives up under there. I like the story of Naomi and Ruth because Naomi followed her husband's direction. The Bible says that Israel came into a famine and that he took his wife and his kid, he, he took his wife and his three sons down to the land of the Moabites. Anybody know anything about the Moabites? They're evil, wicked people. God says, don't go to their land. God says, don't marry them. He took, him to, he took his family to the land of the Moabites, had his sons marry the Moabite women, everything against the will of God. Anybody know what happened? He died and the boys died. And, and Naomi took Ruth and she comes back to Israel and she is so distraught, she is so bitter, she is so angry that when her friends saw her and they were excited to see her, she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Lord has been bitter to me. Now I know none of y'all and women in here have ever been felt bitter. But I do know that we know some women that have gone through so much. I like, I like what Brother um, Jeff, said, Jeff said earlier today that not everybody is going through something, but there are a lot of people who are going through issues of life that are burning some, that are beating them down, that are hurting them. The widow <laughs> and Elijah, one of my favorite stories. The Bible says that she was so poor, she was so broke, she was so destitute, that there was a famine in the land, and, 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 and she was about to fix herself and her son, their last meal. And the Bible says the prophet Elijah knocked on the door. She opens up the door. He says, I'm a man of God. Before you eat that, give me some first. And she's like, nah, bro, this is my last meal. This is for me and my son. He says, I promise you, if you feed me first, God will provide for you. Every one of these women had the same thing in common. Through all of their circumstances, through all of their distresses, through all of their problems, they trusted God more than their circumstances. And that's what I want to preach here today. Trusting God more than your circumstances. Can you go to the next slide? We started out, my very first sermon this year in January was out, out of this book of Mark when Jesus crossed over the sea to go heal a demon possessed man. And now we pick the story back up where he comes back. And a couple months ago, I preached the story about Jarius. And so we're going to pick it up there. At the same time that Jarius is falling down before Jesus, the widow, had, um, the, 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 the woman with the issue of blood, had made up her mind that she was going to seek out Jesus and fight through the crowd. And so you got to picture yourself now. Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says a multitude of people are rushing to him. Think about this. When Jesus fed the multitude on the mountain, how many people were there? 5,000, right? That's just the men. That's not counting the women. That's not counting the children. So just think about that. A minimum of at least 15,000 people. Can you imagine Jesus and his disciples walking through and 10, uh, 15,000 people bumping up, rushing up, coming to see Jesus? Can I tell you something about today, brothers and sisters? A lot of people are looking for Jesus. A lot of people are looking for Jesus just like they were back then. Some of them are looking for a quick fix. Some of them are looking for a miracle. Some of them are just looking to see what can they say about these Christians that who follow Jesus from a negative standpoint. And then there are those who are desperately, desperately desiring Jesus and they don't know how to get to him. So what does Jesus do? He makes himself available. Jarius is coming before him. He falls down. He says, my 12-year-old daughter is dying. And in the background, we see this woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, hurting. And she works her way through the crowd, moving to Jesus. You think it was by coincidence that he happened to be there that day? No, man. This, 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 Jesus makes himself available. And he's doing this to show us 
that no matter what we go through, we can always, always, always go to Jesus. I love that they sung this song, He Knows My Name, because throughout this book, even Luke tells the same story. Not one time do they mention this lady's name. But when she gets done, Jesus knows her. And I guarantee you, when we get to heaven, we'll know her too, and we will know her name. Let's look at the woman's circumstances, all right? She has an issue of blood for 12 years with no cure. That's a sign of hopelessness. She's suffering with no relief from the doctors. That's a sign of helplessness. She spent all of her money. She's broke physically and she's brokenhearted spiritually. She's moneyless. She's all alone. She has no husband. She has no children. She's outcast by the community. And according to the religious belief, she's considered unclean. Do you know what that means? When you're deemed unclean, that means you cannot go out in the public. You can't go to the house of God and worship. She has been banned from all of that. And if she does go out in public, just like a leper, when they're out in public and they got to stay away from me, but they got to say, I'm what? Unclean. I got the cooties. Stay away from me. Think about that, man. Everything in her life has fallen apart, and she has been suffering for 12 long years. And she's come to the point where the last doctor that she went to, he told her, there is no cure. Imagine her mind said, I am going to die alone by myself. No family, no friends, not even the synagogue, not even the church will be there to assist me. She was ashamed. She was fearful. You get that when you read both passages. She was lonely. She was devalued along with continued pain and isolation. Wow. Let me say something real quick, y'all. God will use the very thing that was meant to destroy you to deliver you. God will use the very thing that was meant to destroy you, that was meant to cause chaos, that was meant to, to bring you down. God has the power and the mindset to speak life and turn it around. Turn it around. That's the God that we serve. That's the Jesus that we serve. Who died on the cross, dead, buried, and God said, rise up in three days with all power. Man, that's the God I love. That's the, that's the God I want to serve. Jesus is always available. He sees you. He hears all your prayers. His love his love for you is as, as it is deep. His love for you is as wide as it is deep. That's how much Jesus loves you. Do you know anybody who loves you like that? Oh, we got a whole bunch of people that say, I love you now. But does anybody love you like Jesus? So this woman steps out and figures, let's go to the, next, to the next passage, please. The next slide. Verses 27 and 28, we get back into the text. And she said, when she heard about Jesus, she's in her house and she sees the commotion and she hears that Jesus is walking by, that Jesus is passing by. And she comes up in her mindset of this faith. There's all types of different levels of faith, okay? I, I, I want you to understand that. The question on the floor is, do you have enough faith in Jesus to trust him regardless of how small or how big your faith is? She doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. All she knows is that she heard about Jesus healing people. All she knows is that this guy is some type of a miracle worker, that he's a good man, that he's a rabbi. And she comes up with this mindset of, of, of a desperate faith. Her last hope, I call it also an imperfect faith. 
a superstitious type of faith because she makes up in her mind that, that if I just go and if I just touch the hem of his garment, if I just touch his tassels, somehow, some way, I'll be made healed. That's desperation. That's superstitious. I know none of y'all here are superstitious, but I tell you, I, I claim to be not superstitious, and yet I find myself being superstitious. Sometimes I'm watching the game, and if the Giants are losing, I say, you know what, I'm gonna turn it off for a little bit. And if I turn it off for a little bit, they'll start winning. And then when I go back and I see them winning, I start watching, I say, yeah, yeah. And then they start losing again, and I turn it back off again. <laughs> Superstitious faith. My wife will walk in the room and I say, stop, don't come in here. The game is on, stop. If you cross that line, they're gonna lose, stop. <laughs> do the same thing with God. God, if you do this, God, if you help me do this, if, if you allow this to happen. Am I calling on God because of my relationship? Or am I calling on God because I just want you to step in, God, and just do this thing for me? She doesn't have a relationship, man. She has a radical faith. All these things are good. Her radical faith is, is risk. Versus the rules. Will I step out of my house? Will I work through the crowd, knowing that I have an issue of blood, knowing that I am deemed unclean, knowing that if people see me, if people recognize me, they will cast me out and they will front me out in front of everybody. And I'll be even more embarrassed and even more shameful. Sometimes it takes a radical faith, ladies to step out and trust God. Your husband be against you, the kids be against you, church be against you, your best friends be against you. But deep down in your heart, the Spirit of God is edging you, pushing you, encouraging you, whispering in your ear, take that step, take that step. But what if? How many of us have ever played the what if? Well, what if I do this and then this happens? What if I do this and they make fun of me? What if I do this and they... God has what if everything from the beginning of time. There is no what if that God has already checked off and canceled out. So every time we go before God, well, God, what if? God says, I already got that covered. Just trust me. Just trust me. Woman with no name, woman with the issue of blood, even though you don't know my son Jesus, just trust me. Step out in faith. Fight through the crowd. Do whatever it is that you have made up in your mind. Just don't stay at home. Her faith is a, pers a persevering faith. It's unwavering. Brothers and sisters, once you make up your mind in Christ, and you know that he's told you to do something, you know that he, it is his will. Come hell, come high water, come, come resistance from people in the church. You stand on God's word. It'll be painful. It'll be cruciating. People will mock you. People will not understand you all the time. And you'll be frustrated. You were like, come on, God, I'm stepping out on faith. I'm doing what you said to do. And all this puts back, all this resistance. God says, keep moving. And so she keeps moving. She keeps moving despite the pressures and everything about her. You go to the next slide. I got on here, woman of God, always see yourselves as Christ sees you. There will be times in your life because of circumstances, because of people, because of rejection, you will feel devalued. The own people in your house will put you down. The very people that you love sometimes will turn their backs on you. The very people that, that you work with, that, that, that you hang out with, can shun you 
and push you to the side, making you feel devalued. But always, always, always look at yourself the way God looks at you. How does God look at me? You're, according to God, your value ne- does not decrease based on your circumstances or people's inability to see your worth. Come on, man. Let that sink in. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of even how you feel about yourself, God always sees you as his daughter. God always sees you as his workmanship. God always sees you as the incredible, valuable person that you are. Even though people will step on you, sometimes spit on you, sometimes rip your soul. God says, I love you. How, God, how can you love me and I'm going through all this? Because there's a purpose behind the pain. As Brother Jeff talked about, the suffering is only for a short time. And the suffering is not because I want you just to go through the suffering. The suffering that you're going through is to make you more and more like Jesus. How many people here want to be like Jesus? Raise your hand real quick. All right, all right, all right, all right. Now, I ain't going to ask you to raise your hand because I don't want you to lie. How many of you want to suffer like Jesus? See what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I want to be like Jesus, yeah. Well, in order to be like Jesus, we got to suffer. That's real talk. That's real Christianity. It's not that bumblegum Christianity. Oh, if you have faith and da da da, you believe it, everything is going to be happy and everything's going to be hunky dory. No. Ask the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years how she suffered. Go to the next slide, please. Let's look at the woman's encounter, starting at verse 29. So I'll start at verse 28. She made up in her mind, if I only touch his clothes, I will be made well. She fights through the crowd. She lowers herself down to the ground. And she touches the rabbi's hem. All rabbis in in, in the Bible days, they wore a robe. And at the end of their robe was these tassels. And that identified them from everybody else. That let you know that this person was a rabbi. That this person was a man of God. And so she made up on her mind, if I just touch the tassels, if I just get enough, close enough just to touch it, God will heal me. <laughs> so when she touched it, five days later she got healed. Is that what the Bible says? Two days later. An hour later. Okay, I just want to make sure you got the same Bible that I got. The minute she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, her body, and she knew she was immediately healed. She knew that the blood had dried up. She knew that somehow, someway, a miracle happened in her life. Can you, come on, man, picture this. You're desperate. This is your last thing of hope. If you had talked to your friend and said, man, I'm going to do this, they would have said, no way, no how. And she steps out and she does it. And the Bible says immediately she was healed. (laughs) Now she's trying to get away. She touches him, she's healed. She's like, okay, it's time for me to move. The crowd is on Jesus, and Jesus stops. Hold up, wait a minute. Who touched me? (laughs) When you read Luke, Luke says, Peter said, come on, Jesus. Look at all these people around you. Are you serious? Everybody's bumping him. Jesus was like, No, somebody touched me because I felt my power (laughs) leaving. When you read the word touch in the Greek, it's not somebody touched me. Huh? It's not not she went down and she just touched him. When you read it in the Greek, Jesus says, who grabbed hold of me? You see the difference there? 
Jesus says, who grabbed me? Who grabbed hold of me? With all these people bumping and touching them, there was only one person in the whole crowd of people that actually grabbed them and held on to them with intentions. And then she tried to let it go and move on. <laughs> Watch that last one right there. She desired to escape her circumstances, but God. Huh? She desired to get up and run and flee and act like ain't nothing happened. She said, hold up. Wait a minute. Where you going? You know the story. She humbles herself. She's still afraid. She still doesn't have this relationship with Jesus. She's still feeling awkward. And so she's standing there in front of the whole crowd now. And Jesus is there. And in her mind, he's about to drill me. He's about to embarrass me. And he looks at her. He says, what's up? And then she tells him, she says, um, verse 32, verse 33, I'm sorry, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Jesus, I don't know you. I don't know if you really are the son of God. I don't know if you are the Messiah. I don't know if you are the Christ. But I heard that you heal people. And I made up in my mind, Jesus, that if I just touched your hymn, I would be healed. And Jesus, when I touched it, I was healed. And I tried to get away, but you stopped me. Watch what Jesus says to her. I love this. And he said to her, daughter, he knows your name. That word daughter doesn't mean that she's his child. The word daughter means it's a term of endearment. It's a term of there's now this relationship. So Jesus calls her, calls her daughter, and he says to her, your faith, your faith, your desperate faith, huh? Your superstitious faith, your radical faith has made you whole. If y'all got your Bibles, you need to circle that word. Because that word whole does not mean physically healed. Because you do know what happened years later with that lady? You know she ended up dying, right? So when Jesus heals you physically, it's not for what? Forever. But when he makes you whole, when he makes you whole, that lasts throughout eternity. When Jesus steps in, she now knows that Jesus is not just a, a, a rabbi. She now knows that Jesus is who he says he is. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the I Am. The I Am. <laughs> I heard a preacher one time say, I am. And somebody said, I am what? He yelled back, whatever you need me to be. That's what God says. Huh? I'm Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide. Woo! I'm Jehovah Nisi. Huh? The Lord is my victory. Man, come on, man. I'm Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah um, Rapha, the God who heals. I am. She walks away with a personal relationship. She walks away now with confidence. She walks away now with, with, with boldness. <laughs> Think about this. Before God, before she got there, she was in shame. When she leaves, she leaves in honor. Before she got there, she was in fear. When she leaves, she has confidence. Before she got there, she had no name. When she leaves, she's called daughter. Before she got there, she was alone and by herself. And when she leaves, everybody's clapping for her. Everybody's patting her on the back. Everybody's saying, you go, girl! Oh, I'm sorry. We're in the press of tears. Like, you go, honey. Go. God, God bless you.
Women of God, Christ has no limitations. There are no boundaries that can stop him from coming into your life and changing your heart and changing your circumstances. There is nothing too hard for God to do. The only thing he can't do is fail. The only thing he can't do is fail. Even at your lowest moment, Christ can come into that situation, pick you up, stand you up, plant your feet on solid ground. So here's my question that I have for you women of God. Are any of you desperate enough to cling on to your Lord Jesus? Speak life and live. Father God, we've heard your word. Now, Lord, we ask that you would manifest your word in our lives, Lord. Father, there are women here who are truly hurting. Women here, Lord, who are truly looking for a savior, truly looking for answers, truly looking for relief. Not religion, but you, Jesus. And so, Father, I intercede for them. I bring them before you right now, almighty God. That you would intervene in their lives, Lord. That through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would speak to them, God. And assure them, Lord, that you love them. That you have a plan for them. And that the pain that they're going through, Lord, is only for a short while in lines with eternity, Lord. And the main thing is that they don't, that they have a relationship with your son, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We say thank you. We say thank you, God. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your love. Thank you for dying on the cross for us and being raised from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Join me in the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um.